The title of today's message is Restoration. We serve the God of restoration. We serve the God who restores. And our text is going to come from Psalm 51, Restoration. Heavenly Father, you are so good. We thank you that you are the God who restores, that you are the God that makes all things new. And I pray, God, that you will anoint me to teach this message, Lord God. Thank you that the latter rain shall be greater than the former. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former, Lord God. We're going to receive back more than what we lost. The final state is going to be better and greater than the first condition. You are the God who restores, and we bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. In Psalm 51, we see uh, the prayer of repentance of David, the king, after he had slept with Bathsheba, uh, committed adultery, Nathan the prophet has come to him. Imagine this man for all those months until he's confronted with his sin, for all those days before he's confronted with his sin, living in this beautiful palace with this exalted position, but knowing in his heart that he had committed adultery and had a man killed. He's in a beautiful place, but he's got a very ugly condition. And I'm sure that going through his mind, I mean, the law of the land at that time was, if you commit adultery, you get stoned. It was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. If you kill somebody, you get killed. And, and, and all these things are running through his mind until he gets confronted by Nathan the prophet with his sins. And when he gets confronted with his sins, he doesn't make excuses. He's broken before God. He's accountable unto God. And he asks God for forgiveness. And Psalm 51 is a penitent psalm. We're going to go back to the beginning of it, but we're going to start in verse 12 of Psalm 51. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. The first point I want to make is this, that God will restore to you the joy of his salvation. You can't do something that's so wrong that God won't forgive you. The only sin that's unforgivable is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. When you've known God and walk with God, and then you see the Holy Spirit at work, and you ascribe to that which the Holy Spirit is doing, you ascribe that to the devil. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That sin will not be forgiven. Some people say, well, pastor, you know, have I blasphemed the Holy Ghost? I'll ask them, do you want to be forgiven? They say, yeah, I do. Then you haven't blasphemed. Because the person who's blasphemed the Holy Spirit is someone who's been turned over to a reprobate mind. If there's something in you that wants to be connected with God, that desires God, you haven't blasphemed the Holy Ghost. I say that because when I was really young, when I first uh, came to know the Lord, I didn't have a lot of knowledge. I got saved at 12 years old. I wasn't in church. I was in my own home. And the devil would try to condemn me and make me think that because of something I had done, I had blasphemed the Holy Spirit and could not be forgiven. One of the great things that we find in this honored, honest record in the Bible. I mean, imagine David. Throughout the eons of time, people have read his story. I mean, how would you like your story to be read over and over again of, of what you have done wrong? But, but, but that story is not just a story of having sinned. It's a story of a man who was broken before God and, and had the audacity, having committed adultery and had a man killed, who had the audacity to come before God and say, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Point number one is God will restore to you 
the joy of his salvation. Now, I want to give you the biblical connotation of the word restore. Check this out. Restore. To receive back more than what was lost. Where the final state is greater than the first condition. Whatever you've lost, that you're going to receive more than what you lost. And that the final state is going to be greater than the first condition. How many have lost some things in life? But when we are in Christ, Christ will restore so that the final state is greater than the first condition. You see... All of the things that we lose in life are not as a direct result of sin. I mean, it is in the sense that there wouldn't be loss if sin had not entered into the world. But all the loss we have is not as a direct result of a way that we have disobeyed God. Yet God is a restorer. So you know, you know that restoration has come when the joy and gratitude you have for the time that you are able to spend with the person that you loved and lost is greater than the regret of the time that you've lost. You hear me? God, God, God can restore you to the point where the joy and gratitude you have Let's say you have someone you loved who went home to be with the Lord. God can restore to the point where the joy and gratitude you had for the time you were able to spend with that person is greater than the pain of the time that you've lost. That's restoration. How many people know that God can restore? There are times in our lives sometimes where we're dealing with folk who just don't seem like they want to change. And in your mind, you can feel like, I am wasting time. I am investing and pouring myself into someone that's not bringing forth fruit, not showing any appreciation. In fact, some folk, the more you love them, the less you be loved. But God is a restorer. God is a restorer because all that that you're pouring in them, even though you might not see with your natural eyes what's happening, underneath the surface, God is at work. He's going to bring forth fruit. And even if that person is too much of a knucklehead to receive what it is you're pouring in, amen, there will be a product, a product because just you participating and being a part of the cycle of love that God has initiated in his love for us, even if it does nothing for them, it will do something for you. Jesus loved his disciples until the end. Everybody say restoration. Yeah, I'm getting better. We are going higher in God. Amen? And whatever I have forsaken for the cause of Christ, I've only forsaken it with the expectation and knowledge that what I receive is going to be so much greater. There is also a restoration for those who have sinned against God. When we turn to God, God will not only forgive our sins, but will restore us fully freeing us from the grip of the misplaced passion that led us down the wrong path in the first place. God will change our heart. He will change our minds. He will justify us and make us new. And here we have David crying out to God, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Let's go back to verse one. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. David cries out to God, have mercy on me. He has sinned against God. He has committed adultery with Bathsheba. He's had Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, killed. He cries out to God. He says, have mercy upon me according unto thy loving kindness. What is mercy? 
Mercy comes from a Hebrew word, namen, which means to stoop in kindness to an inferior. God is greater than us, but he will stoop in kindness to us. To favor, to bestow. It also means to move to favor by petition. In other words, we petition God, acknowledging our sins, and he stoops to us in favor. He could have judged us according to his sin, but instead he had mercy upon us and sent us a propitiation for our sin, Jesus Christ. That's mercy. Maybe I can break this down. Grace is God's unmerited favor. Some people would describe grace as getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is also favor, but mercy is not getting what you do deserve. (laughs) We do deserve, based on our sin, to die and go to hell. But God has been merciful to us. When we petition him, he stooped. He came in the person of Jesus Christ, and he was merciful to us. How many people are thankful for God's mercy? If you don't need any of it, let me have some of yours. I need all the mercy I can get. Dictionary definition, mercy, compassion, or forgiveness towards someone whom it is within one's power to harm. I mean, Christ could harm us. He could have punished us. We could have felt the full brunt of our sinfulness. But God, when we call upon him, he chooses to be merciful. That's part of his nature to be merciful. See, David says, have mercy upon me, O God. Look at this. According to what? According to your loving kindness. It's an appeal to God's loving kindness. See, to appeal to God's loving kindness, you have to know that he is loving and kind. And that comes from an intimate relationship with him. You, you know that he is loving and kind when you really spend time with him. You know that's part of his, everybody say that's part of his nature. See, look, let's say, for instance, that you were trying to bench press 600 pounds, right? And, and, and you want me to spot you according to my power. Guess what? You're going to be sitting up under that weight for a while. Because I do well to bounce 60 pounds off my chest. <laughs> but, but if you ask God to spot you and ask him to help you lift the weight according to his power, you're going to lift a whole lot of weight, aren't you? Because he is all-powerful. And so when you call upon God to be merciful to you according to his loving kindness, that can cover the sin of adultery. That can cover the sin of unbelief. That can cover, what it, that can cover a multitude of sins because God's loving kindness is so vast. But in order to appeal to that part of God, you have to know him in that way. Look at Psalm 63. It comes from intimate communion with him. See, when the the communion is broken, that's when people will often run away from God. Remember how the voice of God walking in the cool of the garden? What are Adam and Eve doing? Hiding behind trees. Because the fellowship had been broken. But even then, God was willing to find them and meet them where they are. How many are thankful that even when we go astray, God is not passive. He'll come and meet us where we are to extend to us another opportunity according to his mercy for us to be restored. God sent the prophet Nathan to David to confront him with his sin because he loved David and he loves us. In order to appeal to God according to loving kindness, we have to know him in that way. 
Psalm 63, verse 1. O God, thou art my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. To see thy power and thy glory so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. God, your loving kindness is better than life. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. How many here know that God's mercies are new every morning? Go to Lamentations chapter 3. New day, new mercies. Oh, my Lord. And you know what? There will come a day yes. where the sun will never yes. set. <laughs> there will come a day when you don't need new mercies because there's no sin to cover because you are in a perfect state living with a perfect God. And God himself will be the sun. He himself will be the continual and everlasting light. And your latter state shall be greater than your former. Lamentations. Hallelujah. Chapter 3. New mercies for a new day. We ain't in heaven yet. We need them mercies. Come on up, son. Here comes the sun. Here comes the sun. And I say, it's all right. <laughs> I want that sun to rise because I need those new mercies. <laughs> Lamentations. Chapter 3, verse 21. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. We have to remind ourselves of how good God is. We have to remind ourselves of how merciful God is. We have to remind ourselves because we can let things slip. We can forget who God is and we can forget who we are. That's what happened to David. He got a glimpse of Bathsheba, and he forgot who God was in his life, and he forgot who he was. We've got to, everybody say, remind ourselves. When you get tempted by the devil, remind yourself of who God is. Remind yourself of, of who you are in him. It says, this I recall to my mind. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions Fail not. The, the only reason why I'm, I, I'm, I have, wasn't struck dead years ago is because of God's mercies. The only reason why I'm able to be the person I am today is because of God's mercies. There but for the grace of God go I. That's why we can't afford to be judgmental and look down long spiritual noses at people. How dare we forget what God brought us up out of? He brought us out of a mucky, miry clay. See, all of us, before we came to know Jesus, were on our way to hell. And some of us were going there with a religious smell. But all of us are in need of that mercy. We have to recall this to our mind. It says in verse 23, They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The mercies of the Lord are new every morning. Every morning there are new mercies. And so going back to Psalm 51, David is praying and calling out to God in repentance. Psalm 51 says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Restoration begins with godly sorrow and repentance. Verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Sin and iniquity are not the same thing. To sin means to miss the mark. You know, let's say you're a bowman and you're trying to hit the bullseye and, and you bend your bow and you shoot your arrow. 
and your arrow misses the bullseye, misses the target altogether. You have missed the mark. God has given us a perfect mark. And when we sin, we miss that mark. That's what sin is. And so David says, cleanse me from my sin. But he also says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Iniquity is sin at its worst. It is premeditated. I mean, you've thought this thing out and continual without turning to God. Now, if you continue in iniquity, you know, eventually your, your conscience will be seared and sin won't even bother you anymore. You will totally lose your fear and love for God. But, but David, there was iniquity in his heart. There was a hardness of heart that it occurred in him. There was something that was happening in him that was causing him to continue in this sin, to continue in this lie, to continue in this cover-up. But how many people know that God can cleanse us of that too? He's saying, look, I acknowledge my sin. Verse 3, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. He's saying, I'm not covering it up. I'm coming clean. I'm no longer living in the shadows. I'm no longer living in presumption. You see, the, one of the dangers for us as human beings is we have a way of thinking and working things out in our mind that has nothing to do with God's word. A lot of times when people have addictions, part of what keeps them in it is they keep saying to themselves, I'm going to find a way to control this thing. I know, I know it looks like it's got me. I know it looks like it's, care, it's, it's bringing me down, but I'm going to find a way to bring this thing under control. Well, the way to bring it under control is through surrender to God. You don't have the power in and of yourself to change yourself, to gain that control. But God can change you. A lot of times God will change you before God changes it. A lot of times God will restore you before he restores your stuff. Did you get that? Quickly go to Proverbs chapter 14. Are you getting something out of this teaching? Are you glad that you sprung forward? I know you lost an hour of sleep and then had to work your way through all them snowflakes and then, you know, just that feeling of, you know, you, you, you go to bed Saturday night and you say, oh man, I might be able to sleep in and then you look out and there's snow on the ground but there's not snow on, you know, there's not a whole lot of snow on the road but already kind of in your mind you're saying, boy, I felt like this might be a sleep-in day and, but you press on anyway, say amen. How many people are glad you pressed on in? <laughs> Proverbs 14:12. There is a way which seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. The heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? But God tries the reins of the heart. That's why we need that deep, intimate relationship with God, where he'll, he'll, he'll establish truth in our inward man. And the truth that he experiences in, you experience, see, you experience it in your lifestyle. Build it in here, and then you will experience it out there. Somebody say amen. amen. David acknowledged his sin. Well, God, you know, this woman, this woman that you gave me, she the one who gave me the fruit, and I did eat. No. I, it's me, God. No excuses. Well, well, uh, uh, Mr. Teacher, I would have turned it in, but the dog ate my, ate my homework. No excuses. No excuses. The ACC tournament was on. My favorite team was playing. And I just wanted to watch the game, so I didn't get my homework done. No excuses. But see, the good thing is, when you're dealing with God, you can say, have mercy on me. Your teacher might not have mercy on you. (laughs) 
but God will have mercy upon you. Psalm 51, verse 4. Against thee, the only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. David saying, I sinned against you. Now, there were many people who are hurt by David's sin, but he has also offended God. I say this because sometimes people do stuff that hurts people, and then they ask folk for forgiveness, but they don't want to hear about how they had hurt them. They just want the person to say, okay, I forgive you, let's move on. You, you, you know, you want, to, you want to inflict all the pain and all the punishment, but you don't want to feel any of the hurt. You don't want to experience any of the consequences. It doesn't work like that. Say amen. amen. I mean, David had, he was forgiven of his sins, but he had consequences. I mean, if you steal the ground beef from the meat section and put it in your overcoat and get caught and ask God for forgiveness, right? You will be forgiven, but you also might spend a night in jail smelling like ground beef. Everybody say consequences. So it's not that David is ignoring the fact that he has done harm to others, but he is acknowledging that any time we transgress God, we have God's law, we have offended God. And he says, against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. David is experiencing godly sorrow. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. See, repentance begins, I'm sorry, restoration begins with godly sorrow and repentance. Godly sorrow. And there's a difference between godly sorrow and the sorrow of the world. When you experience the sorrow, sorrow of the world, you're sorry you got caught. When you experience the sorrow of a godly sorrow, you're sorry that you've offended God. You're sorry that you've hurt God. And it causes a change in your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. Well, let's go to verse 9. Uh, what's happened here is Paul had written a letter to the Corinthian church. He had uh, rebuked them um, because they hadn't handled a certain matter properly. And then they repented. And it says in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 7, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. See, when you experience godly sorrow, it causes you to turn from your sin and to God. And, and when you turn from your sin to God, that's something you'll never repent of. That's something you'll never regret. You will never regret obeying God. You will never regret turning to God. You will never go wrong doing things God's way. It says in verse, at the end of verse 10, but the sorrow of the world works death. For behold, the selfsame thing that you sorrowed after godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you. You see, you want, you want to take care not to offend God in the same way again. Yea, what clearing of yourselves. Yea, what indignation. Yea, what fear. Yea, what vehement desire. When you really repent and turn to God, it ignites a fire in you for the things of God. You won't just be lukewarm when you've truly godly repented. Yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. In all things you have proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. What is God trying to impress upon us? God is trying to impress upon us that he doesn't want us just to make surface changes. Rend your heart, not your garment. Don't just give an outward show of repentance. But in your heart, turn with your whole heart to me, saith the Lord God Almighty. Rend your heart and not your garment. And saints, that takes grace. It also takes some effort. 
It takes effort. I mean, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 4 and 5, you have not yet resisted unto blood striving against sin. Jesus resisted unto blood striving against sin. I mean, it takes, it takes effort to lock yourself in to God and then to stay there because the mind wants to wander. I tell you, how many people know that takes effort? And you know what? It also requires some help. I don't know about you, but I am learning how to ask the Holy Spirit to help me. God, you know how my mind wanders. You know how I am. Help me, oh God, to keep my eyes focused on Jesus. Help me, Holy Spirit. Fill me, Holy Spirit, so I don't lose sight of the mercy of God, so I don't lose sight of the goodness of God. That takes effort. And you put effort into what you love. Woo! You put effort into what you love. And when you love God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your strength, and all of your soul, then it's not a great thing for you to pour your whole self into him out of appreciation for him pouring into you. So David has experienced godly sorrow. If, if you want restoration, you've got to have a repentance with godly sorrow. I'm going to talk about this in a second, but a lot of people think that restoration is just a quick fix. Pie from the sky. A lot of times God will give you the ingredients <laughs> so you can produce the pie. We'll dig into that a little bit. I want to read verse 4 through 6 of Psalm 51 in the Message Bible. You're the one I violated, and you've seen it all, seen the full extent of my evil. You have all the facts before you. Whatever you decide about me is fair. I've been out of step with you for a long time, in the wrong since I was born. What you're after is truth from the inside out. Enter me then, conceive a new true life. You know, David said, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. I was born into this world a sinner. You've got all the facts in front of you, God, but don't give up on me. Create in me a new heart. Give me a new life, O oh God. Restore to me the state that you had originally attended for me. God will clean you from the inside out. It says in verse 6 in the King James Version of Psalm 51, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. All right. You know, I don't want to give anybody any free advertising, but just for the sake of fun, go ahead and call it out. What's your favorite detergent? Tide, gain, all, you know. These days we have different detergents that, people, that we use in order to clean dirty clothes. Well, back in the biblical day, hyssop was a, was a herb, an herb that was used like a detergent. It had cleansing power to it, Right? So he says, purge me with hyssop. Isn't it interesting also that hyssop branches were used by the Israelites when they dipped the hyssop branches in the blood and put the blood on the doorposts and on the side posts, so that the spirit of death. I think we ought to look at that. <laughs> Exodus. Let's go to Exodus. Oh, my Lord. Chapter 12. Purge me with hyssop. The, the, 
the natural herb can cleanse the clothes, but the blood that is dipped into can cleanse the heart. And so what should our response to this be? Should it just be to try to cleanse the outward man? Or should we ask God, Lord, clean me up from the inside out? I don't want to outwardly look righteous, but inwardly be wicked. I want you to work the salvation out through me from the inside out. Therefore, work out your salvation. If you're going to work it out, it's got to be in you. Work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. Come on, Holy Spirit. See, God had had told Moses that the spirit of, of death would pass upon the land but that the Israelites were to take a pure lamb and sacrifice it and then take hyssop and and dip the hyssop branch in the blood and then sprinkle that blood on the doorposts. So when the spirit of death came, that spirit of death would pass over that house. It says in verse 22 of Exodus 12, and you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the, when he sees the blood, when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your house to smite you. That represents the blood of Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb. And because we have been sprinkled by that blood, the spirit of death has passed over our house. The devil thought that he could bring eternal destruction into the house through David's sin. But when David called upon God and upon the mercy of God, amen, he called upon a God whose blood is power enough, powerful enough to keep the destroyer out of your house. How many people thank God that your household is covered by the blood, that the destroyer has got to pass over your house? Your children are covered because of the blood of Jesus. You can read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that the children are sanctified by the sanctification of their parents. Wash me. Back in Psalm 51, verse 7, David said, wash me. Now, this was washing back in the old day. You know, these days you just kind of throw your clothes into the washing machine and it just has such a gentle cycle and the water just kind of sprinkles on in there and, you know, the clothes tumble around and then they come out smelling like roses. But back in the day, man, when you wash clothes, you had to beat those clothes. You had to pound those clothes. You had to scrub those clothes. And that's what David wants God to do to him. He's not asking God to send him through a gentle cycle. He's willing to endure, endure the full chastening of the Lord, but he knows that his latter state will be greater than his former. Break me. Break me, O oh God. I'm willing to be broken before God. I'm willing to be broken by God. But I know when he builds me back up, I'm going to be better than I was before. And the extent of my mess and my messiness and and all the things I've done wrong are going to be tiny in comparison to the greatness that God reveals in and through me. I mean, I I don't know if this makes sense to you, but I may have been a good sinner, but I'm going to be an even greater saint. I might have been good. I mean, when I was in the world, I might have been good at being worldly. But, but, But that's small in comparison to how great I am at being like God. I mean, think about Paul. I mean, before he became Paul, he was Saul. He was injurious. He was a blasphemer. 
He was a persecutor of the church. He even called himself a murderer. He was there breathing out threatenings when, when Stephen was killed. But when he got saved, he was more on fire for doing the things of God than he was zealous for doing the things of the devil. And so my question is, how is it that some people were wide open when they were in the world, but then mediocre when they come into the kingdom? I mean, if you can run strong and all night for the devil, how much more should you do for the God of gods who loved you enough to give Jesus Christ his son? How many have made up their mind that you're chasing after God with all of your heart, mind, strength, and soul? Restoration is not a quick fix, but a close, intimate encounter with God that leads to lasting change and renewal. I think I need to say that again. You might want to write this down. Restoration is not a quick fix, but a close, intimate encounter with God that leads to lasting change and renewal. Maybe I can explain this to you in a way that will really hit home. You, you can make a baby in 15 seconds, but it takes a life to raise a child. You know, a lot of people, they just want, okay, I want to ask God for forgiveness, and bam, I just want everything to be right, and I want myself to be right, and I want everything to fall back in place. Wham, bam, thank you, God. But we have to be willing to go through, everybody say, the process. The process. So we can experience a repentance unto salvation not to be repented of. One that leads to, everybody say, lasting change. And that requires a continual time and renewal with God. How many people have ever had God to restore you? The devil will come to your mind and say, okay, well, if you were in faith, you know, you would be all right right away. The moment you prayed, everything would be all right. But how many people know sometimes it's a process? But God allows you to go through that process because he knows about the product. He knows that your latter state is going to be greater than your former. Or to put it differently, you didn't get to where you were in one moment, and it might take God more than a moment to get you where you're going, but if you'll stick with God, he'll make you better, you'll be better off as a result of the process. You could spend four years in college, then get a two years master's degree, and come out of your master's degree making less than a person who has no high school education whatsoever. That can happen. The process won't always necessarily lead to an immediate product or even the product that you expected. But when you go through the process of God, you're always going to come out better than you were if you had refused to go through that process. If you want to experience restoration, you've got to be willing to experience, everybody say, process. process. Grieving is a process. See, as Christians, the Bible does not say we don't sorrow. The Bible says we don't sorrow as those who have no hope. But God will restore to you your joy. He will restore to you your strength if you continue to be broken and pour out your heart to him in the process. Everybody, look at somebody and say, it's a process. And, and look at them and hug them and say, I'm, give them a big hug. I mean a big hug. And tell them, I'm in process. I'm in process. I'm in process. I'm in process. Woo! Woo! Restoration has finally come. Restoration doesn't begin the moment it gets better. Restoration begins the moment you get better. David didn't pray, and God restore my stuff. He said, God, res he restores my soul. Because once your soul is restored, the harvest is already in you. And what God produces in you, he will produce through you. Oh, man. Restoration. Verse 8. Make me to hear joy and gladness 
that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. There is joy, joy, joy in the presence of the Lord. There is joy. I just want some worshipers in here just to lift up your hand and to bask in the presence of God. Let him pour out his loving kindness and his mercy upon you. Pour it out upon us, Holy Spirit. Oh, God, we bless you. There is joy in your presence. I am content in you. I am full in you. I rejoice in your presence. Cast me not away from thy presence. I value your presence. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, O God. I hunger and thirst after you. Fill me. Do you know why Jesus dropped such great uh, drops of sweat and blood? Do you know why that came out of his pores? Do you know why his capillaries burst there in the Garden of Gethsemane? Do you know why he said, if it's possible, let this cup pass me by. Nevertheless, my will, not thy will be done. It wasn't because he was afraid of the physical torture of the cross. Because there are many other people throughout the ages who had been crucified. Jesus wasn't the only person who had been crucified. That wasn't why Jesus was in such anxiety. The reason why he experienced what he experienced is he knew that for that period of time, he would be separated from God. And having been God and with God from the beginning, the thought of being separated from him was unimaginable. He knew that he would have to experience strength just to go through six hours of being separated from God. And when you have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. The thought of not being in intimate fellowship with him is unthinkable because there's joy in his presence. Man, I'm going to tell you the truth. Life can be hard enough being saved. I have no idea how people who don't know Jesus do it. I know that's right. But there is joy in his presence. There is joy in his presence. How many have ever had hell breaking out all around you but had joy in your heart? How many have ever had God anoint your head in the very presence of your enemies so that your cup ran over? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There is joy in God's presence. David says, make me to hear joy and gladness. Verse 12, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. And so our first point is that God will restore to you the joy of his salvation. But in the second part of this verse, we get to our second point for today. It says, and uphold me with thy free spirit. I want to read verse 12 to you in the New International Version. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Our second point is God will restore you so that you are better than you were when you started. People often think that if they are better off, things will be better. And so there are sometimes when people think of restoration, they think of stuff. And if I get my stuff back, then I will experience restoration and things will get better. People often think that if they are better off, things will be better. God wants to make you better. He wants to put a willing spirit in you. God wants to make you better, then things will get better and you will be better. When God restores you, He's not content to let you go back to being the same person you were before he restored you. 
He will meet you at the point of your need in such a way that after the storm is over, you are better equipped to face the next storm. I am not who I used to be. I am not what I used to be. Man, used to be, things go wrong, and people know where they can find me. And it wasn't in church. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, things go wrong and people are looking at you. They want to see. How, how long, how long, how long going to be? I know it's just a matter of time. But God, everybody say, but God has changed me. I'm not the person who I used to be. Amen. I, I, I'm not bound by sin. I, I'm not that same person. I've been made new by God. I don't react the same way. I don't think the same way because I'm not the same person. I've repented and God has restored me. I'm stronger than I used to be. When God brings you back to where you were supposed to be, then you'll be able to produce what you are supposed to produce by his power with his favor. You see, in the book of Joel, the people of Judah had sinned. God sent locusts to eat up their harvest. Things got so bad that even the winos were howling for wine. You know that's bad. When the winos can't find no wine. <laughs> but that, that, that's how bad the blight was. But, but God says, look, rend your heart and not your garment. Everybody fast. Back in the days of Israel, if you got married, a whole year you didn't have to go to war. That husband and wife just got to enjoy one another for a whole year. But, but, but during this time, God says, no. Even, even the newlyweds, y'all come up out of there. We're going to all fast and pray. Everybody seek the face of God. Amen? But, 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 but once the children of Israel did seek the face of God in repentance, God said, look, your garners, your storehouses, I'm going to refill. That which the canker worm and palmer worm ate is going to be restored. But he went on to say, I'm going to restore the years. The years that the canker worm and palmer worm eat, ate. Those locust years are going to be restored. I'm going to give you some spirit-filled years. The years where you are a destructive force in your family. God's going to replace that. And now you are going to be a constructive force in your family. You're going to be an example to your family of who Jesus is. Those brain cells that you destroyed, that they said never come back again. I'm going to give you a new mind. I'm going to give you a mind of Christ. Amen. You're going to have a better mind than you did before you indulge in that sin. I'm going to restore it to you. And see, when God restores you, he restores your harvest. He restores your harvest because he restores your seed. And that seed is the word of God. Woo! Somebody say restoration. 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 God's taking you higher. God's taking you further. God has blessed you with a harvest. God has restored you. And look at what David says. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Once God restores you, go tell the lost who helped you get it all back. If God can save me, David saying, he can save anybody. How many people got that attitude? If God can restore me, he can restore you too. You've got a witness. You've got a testimony of the restoration power of God. And it's too great to keep to yourself. Restoration. Restoration. Restoration through Jesus Christ our Lord. Give the Lord a clap offering. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for restoring us. Heavenly Father, 
we thank you that you are the restorer. You're the restorer of our souls. And you've called us to be the repairer of the breach. Once you restore us, we have a responsibility to go and tell other people about Jesus Christ. Come and see a man. Restore the years. Last Sunday, I taught on restoration. Restore the joy. Today, we'll teach on restoration. God restores the years. Heavenly Father, you are our God, our deliverer, and our restorer. We thank you for restoring the years that the canker worm and palmer worm have eaten. That our latter state will be greater than our former. The best is yet to come. You are the great restorer. Bless your name, O God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. In the book of Joel, we find this prophet named Joel, who's letting the people of Judah know, the southern kingdom, that because of their sins, God is going to send a plague of locusts. And these swarm of locusts are going to destroy the crop. They're going to get into the storage bins. And that there's going to be a great dearth, a great famine in the land that's going to impact every area of society. But that if they will repent, that if they will call a solemn assembly, if they will fast and pray and seek the face of God, that God would restore the years that had been lost by this swarm of locusts. And that's where we pick things up in Joel chapter 2, verse 25. God is speaking, he says, I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. God says he will restore the years. Now, in natural terms, once years are gone, you can never get them back. You probably heard it said, you can't get back. You can't regain the time that you've lost. Yet here in the scripture, God doesn't just say he's going to restore the things. He says he's going to restore the years. Now, the biblical connotation of restore is to receive back more than what was lost, where the final state is greater than the first condition. So God is going to restore the years so that the final state is greater, is better than the original or first condition. What that means is that the best is yet to come. The quality of life in the years that remain will be better than the years that were lost. Now today we're going to look at two categories of years. The locust years and the spirit-filled years. And the years that God wants each of us to live in are the spirit-filled years, the years of abundance, the years of his grace, the years of his mercy, the years of answered prayer. Those are the years that God has called us to. But in order to get to the spirit-filled years, we've got to get past the locust years. Does anybody here know something about the locust years? We're going to talk about them. Look at Joel chapter 1. Beginning in verse 1. Joel chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, you old men, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the earth. Hath this been in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? In other words, the swarm of locusts that God is going to send, uh, it's going to be more severe 
than anything that anybody had ever known. In other words, we know that there are cycles, that locusts come up out of the ground, and they're like us that they're, they're cycles that things happen. But God said, this is not any ordinary swarm of locusts. This is an extraordinary swarm of locusts that I'm going to send your way because of your disobedience, because of your sin. Something like nobody's ever seen before. Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children and their children another generation. That which the palmer worm have left, so the palmer worm's going to eat some stuff, but what he leaves behind, the locusts are going to eat. And that which the locust has left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm has left, hath the caterpillar eaten. There won't be nothing left, right? <laughs> what the bill collector doesn't get, the lawyer gets. And what the lawyer doesn't get from you, the physician gets. And what the physician doesn't get, the numbers man gets. <laughs> there ain't going to be nothing left. And that's how sin is. You know, the devil goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And just like the locust devoured the crop, Satan wants to devour you. He wants to devour you for eternity. He wants to devour me for eternity. He has, there's nothing in us that Satan loves. Right. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. This means that the famine was so bad that even the winos couldn't get any wine. You know that's bad. The, a wino is going find, to find a way to get some wine. But because uh, the grapes have been eaten and the vines have been consumed, the drunks are cut off from their wine. They're going around saying, you know, uh, I don't know how it happened, but, you know, I, I got stranded here in Asheville, and, uh, you know, I need some money for a ticket. So I can go to, uh, to my hometown. You got $40, you can loan a brother. And everybody broke. You know, the, the wino can't, can't, get, can't get any wine. That's bad. How many of you know that's bad? So it says, awake you drunkards, weep, howl, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it's cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up upon my land, strong and without number whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid waste my vine and bark my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, not even any bark left on the tree, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. These are, everybody say, locust years. Locust years are years where what you produce is devoured, and your harvest is is consumed. How can this happen? Unrepentant sin. When there is sin in the land and people are not repenting of their sins, when there is unrepentant sin, that opens the door for the locust years. The Bible says in Proverbs 28, 13, he that covers his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. How many people know we serve a merciful God? Amen. If we'll repent of our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When unrepentant sin runs rampant, every area of society is affected. Verse 11, the farmer is affected. Verse 11, the vine dresser is affected. Joel 1.5, the drunkard is affected. Verse 13, the priest the meat offering is cut off. Even according to verse 18, the beasts of the field are groaning. All of nature, every aspect of society is impacted when the people of God turn away from God and live in unrepentant sin. Or if I can bring it home, a lot of times people in the church want to complain about all the things that are messed up in the world, but we got to look in the mirror. Things, things would be more orderly in the land 
it was more orderly in the church. As goes the church, so goes the world. Because Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen that my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. As Christians, we should not live in habitual sin. We should not be comfortable with sin. We should not see living a sinful lifestyle as being inevitable. Amen. We should be progressing from faith to faith, from glory to glory. The Bible says that without holiness, no man shall see God. I mean, if you had, uh, you know, a couple of mice in your house, would you do something? Or would you just learn how to live with the mice? I, I, see some, I see some mouse droppings. Maybe he's just dropping by just to, you know, check out the cheese in my refrigerator. And then he, No, no, no. You see some mouse dropping. There's not just one mouse. There are a couple of mouse. You see two mice. For every two mice you see, there are another 14 mice. Up in your insulation multiplying. And they're quiet jokers too. You, they're quiet jokers for a while until they overpopulate and have to go in, out of their hiding places. But once you see them, that means that they've overpopulated where they are. Now they've got, they've been pushed out. And that's how sin is. It will metastasize. It will grow. It will spread. You got to sprinkle some blood on that sin to kill the sin. Hey, man, if you want to kill the mice, you might have a mouse trap. You might have one of those little sticky things. Or you might just get out your broom like the old folk and knock it upside his head. But you better do something. Get you a cat, do something. Get you a black, a black snake will do it. You know, get you a black snake, but you better do something. Some people say, no, if the, if the mouse don't run me out, I know the snake will. Well, what's our remedy? Our remedy is to call on the name of the Lord and not to let sin have dominion over us because we've been bought with a price. We serve a great and mighty God, and we are strong in the Lord our God. See, to put it in today's parlance, when sin runs rampant, the rich, the poor, the young, the old, the saved, the unsaved, the minister, the sinner, everybody is affected. Now, how do we move past the locust years? How do we move past one step forward, two steps backwards? How do we move past cycles of continual dysfunction? Anybody want to know that? How do we move past the locust years so that we can live in the spirit-filled years of abundance? Number one, you've got to understand why the locusts have come. See, God will do something to get your attention. God will use circumstances and situations to get your attention. Look at somebody and say, pay attention. How many people know that God will arrange circumstances? He'll cut some stuff off. Stuff will start happening, happening crazy, and you wonder what in the world going on. God is trying to get your attention. God sent the locusts to get their attention. Now check this out. The Holy Spirit gave, me, gave this to me. Understand this. The locust years begin before the locusts come. I'll say that again. The locust years they begin before the locusts come. You see, the, the, the people were living sinful lives with no regard to God. They were engaged in idolatry, living their lives as though God did not even exist. And so the locust years, the locusts were just God's way of getting their attention. But the locust years began before the locusts came. The problem wasn't the locusts. The problem was the hearts of the people were hardened before God. God sent the locusts to get their attention, to let them know they need to turn to him. How many people have ever got, you know, done dumb stuff, but it seemed like it was working out? That happens sometimes. And then people think, okay, well, I guess I'm okay. But God will send something to get your attention. Anybody experienced that recently? He'll send you something to slow you down, 
to get your attention. <laughs> Talking about slow you down, some of us, we're just too busy. We got our hands in too much stuff. Sometimes God will allow stuff to happen in your life to slow you down, to get your attention. Two, to move past the, trump, the uh, locust years, blow the trumpet and heed the call to repentance. Look at Joel chapter 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the Lord comes, for it is nigh at hand. Somebody say, blow the trumpet. The trumpet is the call of God to all mankind to repent, to turn from our sins and with our whole heart to turn to God. This gospel of Jesus Christ must be proclaimed. And when you preach the gospel, don't preach people's sins, preach Jesus. Number three, fast and pray with intensity and sincerity. If you want to move from lack to abundance, if you want to move from the locust years to the spirit-filled years, then you're going to need to fast and pray. Then you're going to need to turn over that plate. Eat no food, drink plenty of water, and call out to God. Now, I can hear some stomachs talking to me right now. Lies you tell. (laughs) If you are really serious, about God, if you're really serious about turning from your ways and surrendering all to God, then you will fast and pray. This sounds a little fancy, but I'll break it down. Fasting is the transitional alignment mechanism God uses to position you for true repentance. I'll say that again. Let me have three volunteers come forward. I'm going to have to illustrate this. I need three volunteers. Fasting is the transitional alignment mechanism God uses to position you for true repentance. Now, right here, we have your spirit. Here we have your soul. And right here, we have your body, right? God wants your spirit, soul, and body to be aligned with him. There is a blessing that he is going to pour out. He's going to put it first into your spirit. He's going to reveal it to your inward man. It's going to flow through your mind. And your body. (laughs) It's an abundant blessing. It's a life-giving blessing. It's an irreversible blessing. It's an open door. It's a joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. It's harmony and unity in your home. It's everybody being on the same page, going in the same direction. It's a raise. It's a financial increase. It's debt-free living. It's, it's, it's the power to be an ambassador for Christ and to lead other people to Christ that they might know Jesus as Lord and Savior. God wants us to be lined up, right? But there are times where our body is out of alignment, is doing its own thing, right? And our mind is just confused, just going all over the place. Just keep, just keep moving, okay? And our spirit is full of self. Go ahead and hug yourself instead of full of God right? God wants to bring it back into alignment, right? And so what he tells you to do is he tells you to fast. He tells you to deny your flesh so that it can get in line. You see, like the Bible talks about worshiping and bowing down. 
A lot of times God gets our physical body involved with what he wants to do in our spirit to line us up. That's why it is biblical to kneel because that shows humility before God. It is biblical to lay prostrate before God because the, in the net, the, in the, God's lining us up, you see? And so he gives us a mechanism to line up the flesh, yes. amen, so that our soul, spirit, and body can be lined up with God. But see, fasting and prayer lines you up, but it also sets you up for transition. Because see, God's going to restore. He's going to move you from your original state to an even better state. He's going to move you from where you are to where it is he planned for you to be. He's going to move you from mediocrity to excellence. He's going to move you from scarcity to abundance. He's going to move you from sinfulness to righteousness. He's going to transition you. He's going to restore the years. And so when you fast and pray, what you're doing is you're preparing yourself for, everybody say, transition. Transition. Because God... Turn around. Turn around. It's going to take you higher. Come on, let's go up. <laughs> Stay together now. Thank you, Lord. Keep going. One step at a time. God is going to transition you higher. Amen. How many people are ready to go higher? Amen. Now, if you're going to go higher, you're going to have to transition, right? And if you're going to transition, you're going to need to fast. God tells his people to fast. All right, you guys, go on back to your seats. Look at it. I want you to make certain you see it in Joel chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. How, you ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholden from the house of your God. Verse 14, sanctify you a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Fasting, amen? Fasting, denying yourself food and drink. Fasting and prayer does not move God. I'm sorry, fasting does not move God. Fasting does not move God. Faith moves God. But fasting breaks the authority of the flesh that you might be more resilient to the spirit. Fasting sets the condition for transition. Woo! Did you get that? Fasting sets the condition for transition. Before Jesus began his earthly ministry, what did he do? After he was baptized, he fasted and prayed for 40 days and for 40 nights. Sets the condition for transition. So, how many are serious about living the spirit-filled life? If you're serious about living the spirit-filled life, you will fast. But you will not only fast, you will also, everybody say pray. pray. Check this out. Prayer is the communication software that you use to talk to God, and that God uses to download truth into your spirit. It's the communication software that you use. To, that's how you talk to God. But it's a two-way conversation. When you pray and fast, God will download truth into your inward man. He will let you know. He will establish truth in your heart so that you can no longer live a lie. You know you're in trouble when you get comfortable living a lie. You're on the way to a reprobate mind when you are comfortable living in sin. But when you have a heart to serve God, whenever you sin, whenever you get miss the mark, there's something in you that says, okay, I'm better than this. I may have done it, but I'm not it. I'm, I'm getting up out of that pig pen in the name of Jesus Christ. And when you pray, God communicates to you and lets you know how loved you are. Because a lot of the dumb things we do, we do just so we can belong. But God says, you belong to me. You are safe in my arms. I love you and care for you with an everlasting love. How many in here know something about the love of God? 
Mother may forsake me. Father may forsake me, but God will lift me up. I am accepted in the beloved. He will never leave me nor forsake me. I am secure in God. And so three, fast and pray. But when you fast and pray, you need to do it with, everybody say, intensity and sincerity. You know, when my Tar Heels win the championship, I, 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 by the way, in my bracket, I, I didn't put them winning the championship. Because in my head, I don't think they will, but in my heart, I do. Lord, help thou my unbelief. But when my Tar Heels win, I'm not going to stand up on my feet and say, go Tar Heels. There's going to be an intensity. First, I'm going to call all them Duke lovers. I'm going to let them know you might have beat us six years in a row in the ACC championship games, but in the ACC tournament, but this year is our year. Amen. I'm going to talk some sure enough junk in the name. I, I'm going to talk some sure enough junk, all right? And, 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 and I'm going to get excited. I'm going to get ready. You, you know when your heart is really in something and when it's not, don't you? Well, when it comes to God, you got to be all in. I want you to look at somebody, give them a high five and tell them, I'm all in. I'm not just pity patting God. I'm worshiping him. I'm all in for God because he's all in for me. There's got to be some intensity and sincerity. And that's why the book of Joel says, rend your heart and not your garment. To really repent of our sins, we've got to have some godly sorrow. We've got to be serious about God and the things of God. A man of God who really had an impact on my life is uh, Shari's dad, Elder Teddy Smith. And, and Elder Smith's wife passed away in her sleep. But one of the things that Elder Smith told me was that the very last thing that her, his wife told her, that Sister Smith told him was, I'm serious about ministry. Yeah. Are you serious about the call of God yeah. on your life? Are you serious about Jesus Christ? When you're serious about Jesus, you won't let anything distract you or deter you because you are sold out to God. Yeah. When people were just sorry they get, got caught or wish that things were just a little better, that's different than really understanding in your heart that you have sinned against God and you want it to be right between you and God. Hallelujah. There's got to be a sincerity and a sin. And, and that brings us to point four. Repent. Turn from your sins and turn to God with your whole heart. Joel 2 and verse 12 says, Therefore also now saith the Lord, Turn you even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garments. Turn unto the Lord your God. Look at this. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and it repenteth him of evil. Who knows if he will return and repent, and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. You know, God has decided to send some locusts, but if we repent, Who knows? He might turn back the locusts and leave a blessing. When God visits you, when God visits you, he will always leave a blessing. You cannot experience a touch from God and not also receive a blessing. Because in him is the fullness of all things. When you get into the presence of God, you can't be in that presence and not come out better. Now, there are some people you can hang around with and you come out worse. It, do you know, have you ever met somebody who brings out the worst in somebody you love? There are some people, you know, you spend time with them and man, you just feel worn out afterwards. You fighting stuff off and praying in the Holy Ghost just to keep your sanity. But when you get in the presence of God, amen, when you get in the presence of God, you're always uplifted. You're always uplifted, amen? And really, the way it should work, Holly, and we're going to touch base on this, when you're in the spirit-filled years, you may may encounter somebody who got all sorts of spirits on them, all sorts of stuff going on in their lives, but the strength of what's happening in you is stronger than what's happening in them. So it's not that you leave neutral, 
they leave better because you've been with them, and you leave better because God has poured out of you to bless their lives. Some of y'all are afraid of the devil. Some of y'all are afraid to be around crazy folk because you're afraid you might grow crazy. Amen? But, but the, the soundness that God has put in you is greater than the craziness that's in them. You are the salt of the earth. You are a world changer in the name of Jesus Christ when you've entered into the spirit-filled years. Let's see if we can get there. Hallelujah. Are you getting this? So everybody say, repent. repent. We got to turn from our sins and turn to God. Point number two. After, so point number one is this. Write this down if you're taking notes. Point number one. The locust years end where repentance begins. I'll say that again. The locust years end where repentance begins. The locusts come because of our unrepentant sin. But when we turn from our sins and turn to God, the locust years end where repentance begins. Point number two. After repentance comes deliverance. When you repent of your sins, God will deliver you. Look at Joel chapter 2, verse 18. Now, in verse 12 through 17, there's been a call to repentance. We read about in verse 12, turn to me with your whole heart. Then in verse 18, it says, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Did you know that God's name is jealous? Exodus, I think it's Exodus 34, 14. God's name is jealous. You see, it's sinful for you to be jealous over something that's not yours, but it's biblical for you to be jealous over that which is yours. God says, you are mine, and I'm jealous over you. I ain't sharing you with no devil. How many people praise God that God's not going to share us with no devil? He said, look, I want you. God says, I want you all for myself. I love you with an everlasting love. I'm not a suspicious husband, but I'm a jealous husband. I'm a jealous husband. You can take my car. Yeah. Yeah, you can take my car. <laughs> you can take my refrigerator. <laughs> but if you try to touch my wife, it's on. It is on. It's on. Because cause that's my wife. And see, that's how God is over you. That's my child. And if you want to mess with my child, you picked a fight with me. That's why no weapon that's formed against you shall prosper. Because God is on your side. And he will fight the battle for you. Somebody say amen. Amen. And so after repentance comes, everybody say deliverance. Then will the Lord, when you repent, then will the Lord be jealous for his people and pity his people. And this brings us to point number three. God doesn't just deliver, he restores. Look at verse 19. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no more make you a reproach amongst the heathen. God claims us as his children. The Lord answers and says, oh, my Lord, I'm I'm going to restore to you what's been stolen from you. Verse 20, but I will remove far from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the uttermost part of the sea. And his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he has done great things. God says, I'm going to remove your enemy. I'm going to make your enemies your footstool. Verse 21, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. What is God saying? I'm going to restore your joy. You see, when we repent and God delivers us, he not only delivers us, but he restores us. You see, the the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, that the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
The devil wants to take your joy away. Because if he can take your joy, he can also take your stuff. Because your joy is your strength. But when you got your joy back, then your stuff is protected too. Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's something that Satan cannot touch. Your joy. God will restore your joy. Has anybody ever been through a season of depression when it, you just couldn't see the light of day? You, you, they're just, the clouds of the sun was shining, but the clouds of sadness were so strong that life just didn't even seem worth living. But when we turn unto the Lord and the Lord shines upon our situation and speaks concerning us, amen, then we can experience that joy. Then the sun will come out again. Then we will have hope for tomorrow. Somebody say amen. God will restore your joy, and you shall rejoice. Can I give you an English lesson? Uh, an English lesson? Joy is a noun. Joy is something that you have. Rejoice is a verb. Rejoice is something that you do. If you rejoice, you will have joy. That's why we need to lift up our hands in the sanctuary. That's why we need to dance before the Lord. That's why we need to clap our hands and give glory to God. Get your body involved with what God has downloaded into your spirit. Rejoice and be glad. If you're feeling down and in the dumps, then do the opposite of how you feel. And God will, I, I know this because I experienced this. I think many of you know that when I was a teenager, I didn't experience clinical depression, but I did experience depression. But I grabbed hold of this principle. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And so I've learned that no matter what my situation is, I'm going to rejoice in the Lord my God. I'm going to thank him for the abundance of all things. I'm not going to complain. I'm not looking to man. I'm looking to God. He is my God. I will forever praise him. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, his name is to be praised. You don't have to wait for praise and worship, for the praise and worship to get you pumped up, for the music to get you pumped up. God should be your pump. Everybody say restoration. Restoration. Says, be not afraid, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Verse 22 lets us know that your harvest is coming back. I want want somebody to say this. I want you to say, my harvest harvest has come. come. It's frustrating. It's frustrating to, to sow, to sow, to sow, to give, to give, to give, and to have no harvest, to have your harvest devoured. But your harvest is coming back, and your harvest is now. Somebody say, my harvest is now. Yeah, because you've sown some good seed. Amen? You've sown some good seed. God is bringing that harvest forth. Because you've moved from the locust years to the spirit-filled years. Now, can I give you some advice here, saints of God? The reason why some people are not enjoying their harvest is because they're spending so much time regretting their locust years. They're spending time beating themselves up because of things they've done and time passed. But God says that your past is in the past. Amen. Your past is in the past. We're going to create, God says, we're going to create some new memories. It's time to stop mourning that which is lost. And to begin to rejoice in that which has been found. Because God said the glory of your latter years shall be greater than the glory of your former. That means the best is yet to come. Learn from the past, but don't dwell in the past. Look at somebody and say, it's time to move on. on. Give them a hug and say, it's time to move on. And when you move on, don't move on alone. Move on with God. 
Move on hand in hand with God. Don't try to do it by yourself. Move on with God. Because every time we try to move on in our own will, we mess it up. But when we move on with God, hand in hand with God, it works out. Amen. You can never go wrong obeying God. You can never go wrong doing the will of God. Because he'll never take you in the wrong direction. It says in verse 23, Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. He's going to send a former rain. <laughs> and then he's going to send a latter rain. <laughs> he's going to send a former rain to make certain that the seed gets down into the ground and does not die in the clod. But then he's going to send a latter rain to make certain that you have a bountiful harvest. (laughs) He's going to send a seed to make certain it goes in. He's going to send a rain to make certain it goes in. He's going to send a rain to make certain it comes out with abundance. And the latter rain will be greater than the former. You may have sown 10 seed, and you may reap 10 apple trees, but all of those apple trees have hundreds of apples on them. So what you reap is going to be even greater than what you sow. You may have led one person to Jesus Christ. That was good seed. But that one person might lead three other people. And those three other people might lead three other people. So as a result of that seed, there might be thousands of souls put into your account. Whatever you give to God, you will always get more in return than what you gave. When you give to the devil, you'll always come out with less. When you give to God, you'll always come out with more. You will be better and it will be better. Y'all didn't get that. I need to say that again. You will be better and it will be better. Some of y'all just want it to be better because you're tired of it whipping your butt. You're tired of what it is doing to you. But God doesn't just want to make it better. He wants to make you better. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 23, it says, he restores my soul. Because if he'll restore your soul, then all the stuff will come with that. Once you are restored, then it can be restored. Your mind can be restored. Your reputation can be restored. Your strength can be restored. God wants to restore you. Once he restores you, then he will restore it. Look at somebody say, God's working on me. And, he, and, he, and, he, and he's working on me not by condemning me. He's working on me not by hitting me upside the head with the Bible, and telling me all the things that I've done wrong and, 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 and making me feel guilty about. No, he's pouring out his grace. He's pouring out his love. He's pouring out his kindness. He's pouring his word into me. And that word is bringing forth fruit. Everybody say restoration. restoration. It says in verse 24, And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. What does that mean? That means pressed down. Shaken together. Running over shall God pour into your bosom. No caps. The God of the increase, 
fulfilled potential, fulfilled purpose. God says, not only is your checking account going to be blessed, your savings account's going to be blessed. And there's going to be more than enough, not just for you to have your needs met, but for you to be a blessing to others. Verse 25 says, and I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. Look at this. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Woo! And be satisfied. Man, I was in my shower the other day. I just started thinking about the goodness of the Lord. I thought I started thinking about my wife. I've got a great wife. I started thinking about my children. I've got great children. I thought I started thinking about my parents. Great parents. I thought I started thinking about the Lord's Church of Asheville. God blessed me to be able to pastor a great church. Start thinking about what I used to be and who I am now. I said, you know what, God, I'm satisfied. I know there's more, you know, but I'm satisfied. It's a good thing to be able to go to bed and be satisfied. Be satisfied. God will satisfy you. And see, you got to get satisfied by faith because Sometimes things aren't going the way they, you want them to. And sometimes people aren't acting the way you feel like they should. Everything, anybody know what I'm talking about? Now come on now. But see, God can anoint your head in the presence of your enemies. <laughs> so that all sorts of confusion is happening all around you. But you are in right relationship with God and you're satisfied. He restores my soul. You shall eat and sit plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt wondrously, wondrously with you and my people shall never be ashamed and you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. The years that the worms ate, God says, I'm going to restore to you. You're going to eat in plenty. You're going to give me praise. You're going to know that I am in your midst. Now, everything that we shared thus far is enough to make us happy. How many people are happy in God? But God didn't stop there. What we read here in the book of Joel, that's the Old Testament. We don't live in the Old Testament. We live in the New Testament. We've got a better covenant with better promises. But see, because you see, God is not only going to deliver us from the locust years. He's going to cause us to enter into the spirit-filled years. Look at verse 26. I mean, verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. I want, how many of you are taking, I want everybody to take your bulletin. We'll give you another one. Everybody take your bulletin. I want you just to tear it into as many pieces as you possibly can. Everybody tear. Just tear it. I will, we'll give you another one. I want you to tear it into as many pieces as you possibly can. Now, if you don't have a bulletin, I'm... Share share with somebody next to you. Right. Okay. Now 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 turn around you. Turn around and and, and just kind of just 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 throw these low throw throw these just throw it throw come on throw it throw it throw it on go go ahead go everybody everybody take take this paper and just throw it and throw it. Throw it, throw it, okay. See the the these these were, these were the locust years. These were the locust years. 
and the locusts were everywhere. They're eating up your money. They're eating up your time. They're eating up your joy. They're eating up your potential. They're eating up your purpose. Locusts, locusts, locusts everywhere. Locusts, locusts, locusts everywhere. There were locusts everywhere. Those were the locust years. And the locust touched everybody. The locust touched every part of society. But God says, after these things come to pass, after you repent and turn unto me, there's going to be another outpouring. It's not going to be an outpouring of locusts that devour. It's going to be the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Spirit of God. I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters, they shall prophesy. Oh yes, your young men, they shall dream dreams. There shall be an outpouring and all flesh shall be touched. All flesh shall be moved by the outpouring of God. Now, I know some people are upset about this because you paid a lot of money for that due. And see, that's the problem with some people. Amen. They're not willing to dance before the Lord and sweat their weave out. But I'm telling you, when you have been touched by the goodness of the Lord, when you have been touched and know that God is good, you will begin to dance. You will begin to shout. You will begin to give glory to God because of the outpouring. God will pour out of his spirit upon all flesh. And we see point number four is this. Check this out. The restoring is in the outpouring. You see, if we had time, let, let's go ahead. Everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. And we're going to do a sweep. We're going to do a sweep. All right, go ahead and pick it up. Go ahead and pick it up. Pick it up. God. God, God, that's enough. Now bring it here. Whatever you picked up, bring it here. Bring it here, right here. Just bring it. Bring whatever you picked up. Bring it here. Amen. And go ahead and put it in. Put it in this jacket right here. Put it. Put whatever you've picked up. Just pick it up. Put it right here. Amen. Just just put it right here. Everybody say, no more locusts. No more. Say, no more locusts. No more. Say, no more locusts. No more locusts. Say, no more locusts. No more locusts. No more locusts. No more locusts. No more unrepentant sin. No more self on the throne. No more doubt and unbelief. No more fear that brings torment. No more locusts. No more locusts. No more locusts. No more locusts. Because all of our sins and all of our sinful years have been nailed to the cross of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He paid the price for us, and now He has poured out His Spirit upon all flesh. And so, point number four the restoring is in the outpouring. I want us to go to this chart so that we can compare the locust years to the spirit-filled years. The locust years were consumed by sin. In the spirit-filled years, the believer is consumed by God. In the locust years, locusts swarm and cover the land. In the spirit-filled years, God pours out his spirit upon all flesh. In the locust years, the harvest is eaten by locusts and worms. But in the spirit-filled years, the harvest is enjoyed by God's people and shared with the lost. In the locust years, the seed rots under the clods. In the spirit-filled years, the seed goes down to the ground, dies, and brings forth much fruit. In the locust years, those are lost years filled with lack and regret. In the spirit-filled years, Restored years filled with joy and praise unto God. My God has delivered us. Our God has delivered us from the locust years. We have repented of our sins and turned to him. And he's brought us into the spirit-filled years. We're creating new memories to the glory of God. Give the Lord a clap offering. (laughs) 
Ushers, can you help me by throwing what's in here away and then uh, bringing, bringing me my jacket back? Thank you. Let's go before the Lord in prayer.